Chapter 25 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 25. Look in my face. My name is Might Have Been. I am also called No More. Too Late. Farewell. Dante Gabriel Rossetti. It was Sunday afternoon. Mr. Tristram leaned on the stone balustrade that bounded the long terrace at Wilderley. He was watching two distant figures, followed by a black dot, stroll away across the park. One of them seemed to drag himself unwillingly. Mr. Tristram congratulated himself on the acumen which had led him to keep himself concealed until Doll and Hugh had started for Beaumare. Sybil had announced at luncheon, in the tone of one who observes a religious rite, that she should rest till four o'clock, and would be ready to sit for the portrait of her upper lip at that hour. It was only half-past two now. Mr Tristram had planted himself exactly in front of Rachel's windows, with his back to the house. "'She will keep me waiting, but she will come out in time,' he said to himself, nervous and self-confident by turns, resting his head rather gracefully on his hand. His knowledge of womankind supported him like a life-belt, but it has been said that life-belts occasionally support their wearers upside down. Theories have been known to exhibit the same spiteful tendency towards those who place their trust in them. Of course, she's got to show me that she is offended with me, he reflected, gazing steadily at the Welsh hills. She would not have come out if I had asked her, but she will certainly come as I did not. I will give her half an hour. Rachel, meanwhile, was looking fixedly at Mr Tristram from her bedroom window, with that dispassionate scrutiny to avoid which the vainest would do well to take refuge in noisome caves. "'I wonder,' she said to herself, "'whether Hester always saw him as I see him now. "'I believe she did.' Rachel put on her hat and took up her gloves. "'If this is really I, and that is really he, "'I better go down and get it over,' she said to herself. Mr Tristram had given her half an hour, she appeared in the low stone doorway before the first five minutes of the allotted time had elapsed, and he gave a genuine start of surprise as he heard her step on the gravel. His respect for her fell somewhat at this alacrity. "'I have been waiting in the hope of seeing you,' he said after a moment's hesitation. "'I am anxious to have a serious conversation with you.' "'Certainly,' she said. They walked along the terrace and presently found themselves in the little coppice adjoining it. They sat down together on a wooden seat round an old cedar in the heart of the golden afternoon. It was an afternoon the secret of which autumn and spring will never tell to winter and summer, when the wildest dreams of love might come true, when even the dead might come down and put warm lips to ours and we should feel no surprise. A kingfisher flashed across the open on his way back to the brook near at hand, fleeing from the still splendour of the sun-fired woods, where he was but a courtier, to the little winding world of grey stones and water, where he was the jewelled king. When the kingfisher had left them tete-a-tete, -tete, Mr Tristram found himself extremely awkwardly placed on the green bench. He felt that he had not sufficiently considered beforehand the peculiar difficulties which, in the language of the law, had been imported into his case. Rachel sat beside him in silence. If it could be chronicled that sympathetic sorrow for her companion's predicament was the principal feeling in her mind, she would have been an angel. Mr Tristram halted long between two opinions. At last he said brokenly, Can, can you forgive me? What woman, even with her white hair, even after a lifetime spent out of earshot, ever forgets the tone her lover's voice takes when he is in trouble? Rachel softened instantly. I forgave you long ago, she said gently. Something indefinable in the clear, full gaze that met his daunted him. He stared apprehensively at her. It seemed to him as if he were standing in cold and darkness, looking in through the windows of her untroubled eyes, at the warm, sunlit home which had once been his, when it had been exceedingly well with him, but of which he had lost the key. 
a single yellow leaf, crisped and hollowed to a fairy boat, came sailing on an imperceptible current of air to rest on Rachel's knee. I was angry at first, she said, her voice falling across the silence like another leaf. And then, after a time, I forgave you. And later still, much later, I found out that you had never injured me, that I had nothing to forgive. He did not understand, and as he did not understand, he explained volubly, for here he felt he was on sure grounds, that on the contrary she had much to forgive, that he had acted like an infernal blackguard, that men were coarse brutes, not fit to kiss a good woman's shoe latchet, etc., etc. He identified his conduct with that of the whole sex, without alluding to it as that of the individual Tristram. He made it clear that he did not claim to have behaved better than most men. Rachel listened attentively. And I actually loved him, she said to herself. But the divine quality of woman is her power of forgiving. Her love raises a man, transfigures him, ennobles his whole life, etc., etc. My love did not appear to have quite that effect upon you at the time, said Rachel, regretting the words the moment they were spoken. Mr. Tristram felt relieved. Here at last was the reproach she had been expecting. He assured her that she did well to be angry. He accused himself once more. He denounced the accursed morals of the day, about which he ought to have risen, the morals, if she did but know it, of all unmarried men. That is a hit of Mr. Scarlet, she said scornfully to herself, and then her cheek blanched as she remembered that Hugh was not exempt after all. She became suddenly tired, impatient, but she waited quietly for the inevitable proposal. Mr. Tristram, who had the gift of emphatic and facile utterance, which the conventional considered to be the sign manual of genius, had become so entangled in the morals of the age that it took him some time to extricate himself from the subject before he could pass on to plead, in an impassioned manner, the cause of the man, unworthy though he might be, who had long loved her, loved her now, and would always love her, in this world and the next. It was the longest proposal Rachel had ever had, and she had had many. But if the proposal was long, the refusal was longer. Rachel, who had a good memory, led up to it by opining that the artistic life made great demands, that the true artist must live entirely for his art, that domestic life might prove a hindrance. She had read somewhere that high hopes faded on warm hearthstone. Mr. Tristram demolished these objections as ruthlessly as ducks peck their own ducklings if they had not seen them for a day or two. Even when she was forced to become more explicit, it was at first impossible to Mr. Tristram to believe she would finally reject him. But the knowledge, deep-rooted as a forest oak, that she had loved him devotedly, could not at last prevail against the odious conviction that she was determined not to marry him. Then in that case, you never love me? I do not love you now. You are determined not to marry? On the contrary, I hoped to do so. Rachel's words took her by surprise. She had no idea till that moment that she hoped anything of the kind. You prefer someone else. That is the real truth. I prefer several others. Mr. Tristram looked suspiciously at her. Her answers did not tally with his previous knowledge of her. Perhaps he forgot that he had set his docile pupil rather a long holiday task to learn in his absence, and she had learned it. You think you would be happy with some fortune hunter of an aristocrat than with a plain man of your own class who, whatever his faults may be, loves you for yourself. Why is it that the word aristocrat, as applied to a gentleman, is as offensive as that of flunky applied to a footman? Rachel drew herself up imperceptibly. That depends upon the fortune hunter, she said, with that touch of hauteur which, when the vulgar have at last drawn it upon themselves by the insolence which is the underside of their courtesy, always has the same effect on them as a red rag on a bull. In their own language they invariably stand up to it. Mr. Tristram stood up physically and mentally. He also raised his voice, causing two rabbits to hurry back into their holes. 
Women, he said, were incalculable. He would never breathe in one again. His disbelief in woman rose even to the rookery in the high elms close at hand. That she, Rachel, whom he had always regarded as the first among women, should be dazzled by the empty glamour of rank, now that her fortune put such marriages within her reach, was incredible. He should have repudiated such an idea with scorn if he had not heard it from her own lips. Well, he would leave her to the life she had chosen. It only remained for him to thank her for stripping his last illusion from him and to bid her goodbye. We shall never meet again, he said, holding her hand, and looking very much the same without his illusions as he did when he had them on. He had read somewhere a little poem about a woman's no, which at the last moment means yes. And then there was another which chronicled how, after several stands of upbraiding, we rushed into each other's arms. Both recurred to him now. He had often thought how true they were. I do not think we shall meet again, said Rachel, who apparently had an unpoetic nature. But I am glad for my own sake that we have met this once and have had this conversation. I think we owed it to each other and to our former attachment. Well, goodbye. He still held her hand. If she was not careful, she would lose him. Goodbye. You understand it is for always? I do. He became suddenly livid. He loved her more than ever. Would she really let him go? I'm not the kind of man to be whistled back, he said fiercely. It was an appeal and a defiance, for he was just the kind of man, and they both knew it. Of course not. That is your last word? My last word. He dropped her hand and half turned to go. She made no sign. Then he strode violently out of the wood without looking behind him. At the little gate he stopped a moment, listening intently. No recalling voice reached him. Poets did not know what they were talking about. With a trembling hand he slammed the gate and departed. Rachel remained a long time sitting on the wooden bench, so long that the stooping sun found out the solemn outstretched arms of the cedar and touched them till they gleamed green as a beetle's wing. Each little twig and twiglet was made manifest, raw gold against the twilight that lurked beneath the heavy boughs. She sat so still that a squirrel came tiptoeing across the moss and struck tail momentarily to observe her. He looked critically at her, first with one round eye, and then turning his sleek head with the other, and decided that she was harmless. Presently, a robin dropped down close to her, flashing up his grey underwing as he alighted, and then flew up into the cedar, and from its sun-stirred depths said his say. The robin never forgets. In the autumn afternoons, when the shadows are lengthening, he sings sadness into your heart. If you are joyful, shut your ears against him, for you may keep peace, but never joy, while he is singing. He knows all about it. Love's labours lost. The grey face of young love dead. The hard-wrought grave in the live rock where he is buried. And he tells of it again and again and again, as if love's sharp sword had indeed reddened his little breast, until the heart aches to hear him. But he tells also that consolation is folded not in forgetfulness, but in remembrance. That is why he sings in the silence of the autumn dawn, before memory closes her eyes, and again near sunset, when memory wakes. Still Rachel sat motionless. She had laboured with dumb, unreasoning passion to forget, as a man works his hands to the bone night after night, week after week, month after month, to file through the bars of his prison. She found at last that forgetfulness came not of prayer and fasting, that it was not in her to forget. The past had seemed to stretch its cruel, desecrating hand over all the future, cutting her off from the possibility of love and marriage, and from the children whom in dreams she held in her arms. As she had said to Hester, she thought she had nothing left to give. But now, 
the dead past, had risen from its grave in her meeting with her former lover. And in a moment, in two short days and wakeful nights, the past relinquished its false claim upon her life. She saw that it was false, that she had been frightened where no fear was, that her deliverance lay in remembrance itself, not in the handcuffs with which until now she had bound her deliverer. Mr. Tristram had come back into her life, and with his own hands had destroyed the overthrown image of himself, which lay like a barrier across her heart. He had replaced it by an accurate presentment of himself, as he really was. Only that which is replaced is destroyed, and it is often our real self in its native rags, and not, as we jealously imagine, another king in richer purple, who has replaced us in the throne room of the heart that loved us. To the end of life Rachel never forgot Mr Tristram, any more than the amber forgets its fly. But she was vaguely conscious, as he left her, that he had set her free. She listened to his retreating step, hardly daring to breathe. It was too good to be true. At last there was dead silence, no echo of a footfall, quite gone. He had departed not only out of her presence, but out of her life. She breathed again, a tremor like that which shakes the first green leaf against the March sky, stole across her crushed heart, empty at last, empty at last. She raised her hand timidly in the sunshine. She was free. She looked round, dazzled, bewildered, the little world of sunshine and the turquoises of sky strewn among the golden network of the trees smiled at her as one who brings good tidings. A certain familiar hold on life and nature, so old that it was almost new, which she had forgotten, but which her former self used to feel, came back suddenly upon her like a lost friend from overseas. Scales seemed to fall from her eyes. The light was too much for her. She had forgotten how beautiful the world was. Everything was possible. Some, in the night of their desolation, can take comfort when they see the morning star shuddering white in the east, and can say, Courage, the day is at hand. But others never realise that their night is over till the sun is up. Rachel had sat in a long stupor. The message, writ large for her comfort in the stars, for the night was surely waning, had not reached her, bowed, as she thought, beneath God's hand. And the sure return of the sun at last came upon her like a miracle. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Abbas. Chapter 26. Tis not for everyone to catch a salmon. Everyone who knows Middleshire knows that the little lake of Beaumare is bounded on the one side by the West Hope and on the other by the Wilderley property, the boundary being the ubiquitous drone, which traverses the mere in a desultory fashion and with the assistance of several springs makes Beaubert what it is, namely, to quote from the local guidebook, the noblest expanse of water surrounded by some of the most picturesque scenery in Middleshire. Thither, Doll and Hugh took their way in the leisurely manner of men whose orthodoxy obliges them to regard Sunday as a day of rest. Doll pointed out to Hugh the coppice which his predecessor, Mr George Loftus, had planted. Hugh regarded it without excitement. Both agreed that it was coming on nicely. Hugh thought that he ought to do a little planting at his own place. Doll said, You can't do everything at once. A large new farm was the next object of interest. Uncle George rebuilt green fields from the ground, remarked Doll, as they crossed the high road and took to the harvesting fields, where the ricks stood grey to the sun. Hugh nodded. Doll thought he was a very decent chap, though rather low-spirited. Hugh thought that if Mr George Loftus had been alive, he might have consulted him. In an amicable silence, broken occasionally by whistling for Crack, who hurried blear-eyed and asthmatic out of rabbit holes, 
the pair reached Beaumare, and after following the path through the wood, came suddenly upon the little lake locked in the heart of the steeply climbing forest. Doll stood still and pointed with his stick for fear Hugh might overlook it. I come here every Sunday, he remarked. A sense of unreality and foreboding seized on Hugh as the still face of the water looked up at him. Where had he seen it before, this sea of glass reflecting the yellow woods that stooped to its very edge? What had it to do with him? I've been here before, he said involuntarily. I dare say, said Doll. Newhaven marches with me here. The boundary is by that clump of silver birch. The drone comes in there, but you can't see it. The New Havens are friends of yours, aren't they? Acquaintances, said Hugh absently, looking hard at the water. He had never been here before. Memory groped blindly for a lost link, as one who momentarily recognises a face in a crowd and tries to put a name to it, and fails. As the face disappears, so the sudden impression passed from Hugh's mind. I expect you've been here with them, said Doll. Good man, New Haven. I used to see a good deal of them at one time, said Hugh, but they seem to have forgotten me of late. Oh, that's her, said Doll. She's always off and on with people. Takes a fancy one day and a dislike the next. He's not like that. You always know where to find him. Solid man, New Haven. Doesn't say much, but what he says he sticks to. He gives one that impression, said Hugh. I rather think he's there now, said Doll, pointing to the farther shore. I see a figure moving and two little specks. I shouldn't wonder if it were him and the boys. They often come here on Sunday afternoons. You have long sight, said Hugh. He had met Lord Newhaven several times since the drawing of lots, and they had always greeted each other with cold civility. But Hugh avoided him when he could, without drawing attention to the fact that he did so. Are you going over to his side? he asked said Doll. I've never set a single trimmer or fired a shot beyond that clump of birch or Uncle George before me. The two men picked their way down the hillside among the tall, thin tree trunks. There was no one except the dogs at the keeper's cottage in a clearing halfway down. Doll took the key of the boathouse from a little hole under the eaves. I think Withers must be out, he remarked at last, after knocking and calling at the locked door and peering through the closed window. Hugh had been of that opinion for some time. Gone out with his wife, I expect. Never mind, we can do without him. They went slipping over the dry beach mast to the boathouse. Doll unlocked the door and climbed into one of the boats. Hugh and Crack followed. They got a perch rod off a long shelf and half a dozen trimmers. Then they pulled out a little way and stopped near an archipelago of water lily leaves. Doll got out the perch rod and float and made a cast. It's not fishing, he said apologetically, half to his guest and half to his maker, but we're bound to get some baits. Hugh nodded and gazed down at the thin forest below. He could see the perch moving in little companies in the still water beyond the water trees. Presently a perch, a very small one, out alone for the first time, came up all stiff head and shoulders and wagging tail to the carelessly covered hook. Don't, don't, you young idiot, said Hugh below his breath. But the perch knew that the time had come when a perch must judge for himself. The float curtsied and went under, and in another second the little independent was in the boat. There are other fools in the world besides me, it seems, said Hugh to himself. He'll do, but I wish he was a dace, said Doll, slipping the victim into a tin with holes in the top. Half a dozen will be enough. They got half a dozen, baited and set the trimmers white side up, and were turning to row back when Doll's eyes became suddenly fixed. By Jove, there's something at it, he said, pointing to a trimmer at some distance. Both men looked intently at it. Crack felt that something was happening and left off smelling the empty fish can. The trimmer began to nod, to tilt, and then turned suddenly upside down and remained motionless. He's running the line off it, said Doll. As he spoke, the trimmer gave one jerk and went under. Then it reappeared, awkwardly bustling out into the open. Oh, hang it all, it's Sunday, said Doll with a groan. We can't be catching pike on a Sunday. 
and he caught up the oars and rowed swiftly towards the trimmer. As soon as they were within a boat's length, it disappeared again, came up again, and went pecking along the top of the water. Dull pursued warily and got hold of it. Gently now, he said as he shipped the oars. He'll go under the boat and break us if we don't look out. I'll play him and you shove the net under him. Damn, God forgive me, we've come out without a landing net. Good Lord, Scarlet, you can't gaff him with a champagne opener. There, you pull him in and I'll grab him somehow. I've done it before. Crack, lie down, you infernal fool. Scarlet, if you pull him like that, you'll lose him to a certainty. By George, he's a big one. Doll tore off his coat and turned up his shirt sleeves. He's going under the boat. If you let him go under the boat, I tell you, he'll break us. I'm quite ready. Doll was rubbing his waistcoat buttons against the gunwale. Bring him in gradually. For goodness sake, keep your feet off the line, or if he makes a dash, he'll break you. Give him line. Keep your elbows out. Keep your hands free. Don't let him jerk you. If you don't give him more line when he runs, you'll lose him. He's not half done yet. Confound you, Scarlet. Hold on for all you're worth. All right, old chap. All right. Don't mind me. You're doing it first class. Right as rain. Now. Now. By George, did you see him that time? He's a nailer. Steady on him. Bring him in gently. Keep an even pull on him. Keep steady. Doll craned over the gunwale, his arms in the water. There was a swirl, a momentary glimpse of a stolid fish, face and heavy shoulders, and the boat righted itself. Missed him as I live, gasped Doll. Bring him in again. Hugh let out the slippery line and drew it in again, slowly, hand over hand. Doll's round head was over the side, his long legs spread adhesively on the bottom of the boat. Crack, beyond himself with excitement, got on the seat and barked without ceasing. He's coming up again, said Doll, gutturally, sliding forward his left hand. I must get him by the eyes, and then I doubt if I can lift him. He's a big brute. He's dragging the whole boat and everything. He's about done now. Steady. Now. The great side of the pike lay heaving on the surface for a second, and Doll's left forefinger and thumb were groping for its eyes. But the agonised pike made a last effort. Doll had him with his left hand, but could not raise him. Put him in now, for all you're worth, he roared to Hugh, as he made a grab with his right hand. His legs began to lose their grip under the violent contortions of the pike. The boat tilted madly. Hugh reached forward to help him. There was a frantic effort, and it capsized. Bad luck, said Doll, coming up spluttering, shaking her head like a spaniel. But we shall get him yet. He's bleeding like a pig. He'll come up directly. Good Lord, the water's like ice. We must be over one of the springs. Suppose you're all right, Scarlet. He would come up, but in a very different fashion. Yes, he said faintly clutching the upturned boat. I'm not sure, said Doll, keeping going with one hand, that we'd better not get ashore and fetch the other boat. The water's enough to freeze one. I can't swim, said Hugh, his teeth chattering. He was a delicate man at the best of times, and the cold was laying hold of him. Doll looked at his blue lips and shaking hands, and his face became grave. He measured the distance to the shore with his eye. It had receded in a treacherous manner. I'm not much of a performer myself, he said, since I broke my arm last winter, but I can get to the shore. The question is, can you hold on while I go back and bring the other boat, or, or shall we have a try at getting back together? I, I can hold on all right, said Hugh, instantly aware that Doll did not think he could tow him to land, but was politely ready to risk his existence in the attempt. Back directly, said Doll. Without a second's delay, he was gone. Hugh put out his whole strength in the endeavour to raise himself somewhat out of the ice-cold water. But the upturned boat sidled away from him like a skittish horse, and after grappling with it, he only slipped back again exhausted, and had to clutch it as best he could. As he clung to the gunwale, he heard a faint coughing and gasping close to his ear. Someone was drowning. He realised that it must be crack under the boat. He called to him, he chirruped, as if all were well. He stretched one hand as far as he could under the boat, feeling for him, but he could not reach him. Presently, the faint, difficult sound ceased, began again, stopped, and was heard no more. A great silence seemed to rush in on the extinction of that small sound. It stooped down and enveloped Hugh in it. Everything was very calm, very still. The boat kept turning slowly round and round, the only thing that moved. The sunlight quivered on the wet, upturned keel. 
Already it was drying in patches. Hugh watched it. The cold was sapping his powers as if he were bleeding. I could have built a boat in the time Loftus takes to fetch one, he said to himself, and he looked round him. No sign of Doll. He was alone in the world. The cold was gaining on him slowly, surely. Why had he on such heavy gloves which made him fumble so clumsily? He looked at his bare, cut hands and realised that their grip was leaving them. He felt that he was in measurable distance of losing his hold. Suddenly a remembrance flashed across him of the sinister face of the water as it had first looked up at him through the trees. Now he understood. This was the appointed place for him to die. Hugh tightened his hold with his right hand, for his left was paralysed. I will not, he said. Nothing shall induce me. I will live and marry Rachel. The cold advanced suddenly on him, as at the point of the bayonet. Why not die? said another voice. Would it not be easier in three months' time than it is now? Will it ever be so easy again? See how near death is to life. A wheel within a wheel, two rings linked together. A touch and you pass from one to the other. Hugh looked wildly around him. The sun lay warm upon the treetops. It could not be that he was going to die here and now, here in the living sunshine, with the quiet, friendly faces of the hills all around him. He strengthened his numb hold fiercely, all but lost it, regained it. Cramp, long held at bay, overcame him. And the boat kept turning in the twilight. He reached the end of his strength and held on beyond it. He heard someone near at hand suffocating in long-drawn gasps. Not crack this time, but himself. The boat was always turning in the darkness. The struggle was over. It is better so, said the other voice, through the roaring of a cataract near at hand. Your mother will bear it better so. And all the long difficulties are over, and pain is past, and life is past, and sleep is best. But Rachel? She was here, in the warm, swaying darkness. She was with him. She was death. Death was only her arms round him in a great peace. Death was better than life. He let go the silly boat that kept him from her and turned wholly to her, his closed eyes against her breast. End of chapter 26of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 27. The main difference between people seems to be that one man can come under obligations on which you can rely, is obligeable, and another is not. As he has not a law within him, there's nothing to tie him to. Emerson. Father, said Teddy to Lord Newhaven, do, do do be a horse and I will ride you in the water. Me too, said Paulie. I'm not anxious to be a horse, Teddy. I'm quite content as I am. Lord Newhaven was stretched in an easy but undefensive attitude on the heathery bank with his hands behind his head. His two sons rushed simultaneously at him and knelt on his chest. Promise, they cried, punching him. Two turns each. There was a free fight and Lord Newhaven promised. On a bright, two turns each and really deep. On a bright, said Lord Newhaven. His two sons got off his chest and Teddy climbed on his back in readiness as his father sat up and began to unlace his boots. Hiya, said Teddy over his shoulder, his arms tightly clasped round his father's neck as Lord Newhaven rolled up his trousers. You young slave driver, they won't go up any higher. You said on a bright. Well, Sherlock, I am on a bright. You had them over your knees last time. I had knickerbockers on then. Won't these do the same? They won't come up another inch. Then one, two, three, off, shrieked Teddy, digging his heels into the parental back. The horse displayed surprising agility. It coveted, it kicked, it jumped a little drain, it careered into the water, making a tremendous splashing. The two boys screamed with delight. 
but at last the horse sat down on the bank, gasping, wiped its forehead, and in spite of frenzied entreaties, proceeded to put on its socks and boots. Lord Newhaven was not to be moved a second time. He lit a cigarette and observed that the moment for sailing boats had arrived. The boats were accordingly sailed. Lord Newhaven tilted his hat over his eyes and acted as umpire. It's not usual to sail boats upside down, he said, seeing Teddy deliberately upset his. They're doing it out there, said Teddy, who had a reason for most things, and he continued to sail his boat upside down. Lord Newhaven got up and swept the water with his eye. His face became keen, then his glance fell anxiously on the children. Teddy and boy, he said, promise me that you will both play on this one bit of sand and not go in the water till I come back. They promised, staring bewildered at their father. In another moment, Lord Newhaven was tearing through the brushwood that fringed the water's edge. As he neared the boathouse, he saw another figure trying to shove out the remaining boat. It was Doll. Lord Newhaven pushed her off and jumped in. Doll was almost speechless. His breath came in long gasps. The sweat hung on his forehead. He pointed to the black, upturned boat. This one leaks, said Lord Newhaven sharply. It's got to go all the same and sharp, said Doll hoarsely. Lord Newhaven seized up a fishing tin and thrust it into Doll's hand. You bail while I row, he said, and he rowed as he had never rowed before. Who is it? he said as the boat shot out into the open. Doll was bailing like a madman. Scarlet, he said, and he's over one of the springs. He'll get cramp. Lord Newhaven strained at the oars. Consciousness was coming back, was slowly climbing upwards, upwards through immense intervals of time and space, to where at last, with a wrench, pain met it halfway. Hugh stirred feebly in the dark of a great forlornness and loneliness. Rachel, he said, Rachel. His head was gently raised and a cup pressed to his lips. He swallowed something. He groped in the darkness for a window and then opened his eyes. Lord Newhaven withdrew a pace or two and stood looking at him. Their eyes met. Neither spoke. But Hugh's eyes, dark with the shadow of death, said plainly, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? Then he turned them slowly as an infant turns them to the sky, the climbing woods, leaning over each other's shoulders to look at him, to the warm earth on which he lay. At a little distance was stretched a small, rough-haired form. Hugh's eyes fixed on it. It lay very still. Crack, he said suddenly, raising himself on his elbow. There was neither speech nor language. Crack's tail, that courteous member, made no sign. He was under the boat, said Lord Newhaven, looking narrowly at the exhausted face of the man he had saved, and unable for the life of him to help a momentary fellow feeling about the little dog. Hugh remembered. It all came back. The boat, Crack's dying gasps, the agonised struggle, the straight gate of death, the difficult passage through it, the calm beyond. He had almost got through it and had been dragged back. Why did you interfere? He said in sudden passion, his eyes flaming in his white face. A dull colour rose to Lord Newhaven's cheek. I thought it was an accident, he said. If it was not, I, I beg your pardon. There was a moment's silence. It was an accident, said Hugh hoarsely and he turned on his elbow and looked fixedly at the water, so that his companion might not see the working of his face. Lord Newhaven walked slowly away in the direction of Doll, whose distant figure, followed by another, was hurrying towards them. "'And so there is a Rachel as well, is there?' he said to himself, vainly trying to steel himself against his adversary. "'How is he now?' said Doll, coming within earshot. "'He's all right, but you'd better get him into dry clothes, and yourself, too.' Change on the bank, said Doll, seizing a bundle from the keeper. It's as hot as an oven in the sun. Why, Scarlet's sitting up. I thought when we laid into him on the bank that he was too far gone, didn't you? I suppose, hesitating, crack? Lord Newhaven shook his head. I must go back to my boys now, he said, or they'll be getting into mischief. Doll nodded. He and Lord Newhaven had had a hard fight to get the leaking boat to land with Hugh at the bottom of it. It had filled ominously when Doll ceased bathing to help to drag in the heavy, unconscious body. 
There had been a moment when, inapprehensive as he was, Doll had remembered with a qualm that Lord Newhaven could not swim. Every fellow ought to swim, was the moral he drew from the incident, and repeated to his wife, who, struck by the soundness of the remark, repeated it to the Gressleys. Lord Newhaven retraced his steps slowly along the bank in his waterlogged boots. He was tired, and he did not hurry, for he could see in the distance two small figures sitting faithfully on a log where he had left them. Good little chaps, he said half aloud. In spite of himself, his thoughts went back to Hugh. His feelings towards him had not changed, but they had been forced during the last half hour out of their original entrenchments into the open, and were liable to attack from new directions. It was not that he had virtually saved Hugh's life, for Dahl would never have got him into the leaking boat and kept it afloat single-handed. That first moment of enthusiasm, when he had rubbed the scentless limbs and breathed into the cold lips, and had felt his heart leap when life came halting back into them, that moment had passed and left him cold. But Hugh's melancholy eyes, as they opened once more on this world, and met his unflinchingly, haunted him, and the sudden anger at his interference. It was the entrenchment of his contempt that Lord Newhaven missed. A meaner nature would not have let him off so easily as Hugh had done. It was an accident, he said to himself unwillingly. He need not have admitted that, but I should have been on a gridden if he'd not. In different circumstances that man and I might have been friends, and if he had got into a scrape of this kind a little further afield, I might have helped him to get out of it. He feels it. He's aged during the last two months. But as it is, upon my word, if he were a boy, I should have had to let him off. He would have been too bloodthirsty. But he's seven and twenty. He's old enough to know better. She made a fool of him, of course. She made a greater one of me once, for I married her. Lord Newhaven reviewed with a dispassionate eye his courtship and marriage. A wooden enemy, he said to himself. I likened her to a wooden enemy. Good Lord, and I was thirty years of age, while this poor devil is twenty-seven. Lord Newhaven stopped short with fixed eyes. I believe I should have to let him off, he said half aloud. I believe I would let him off, if I was not as certain as I stand here, that he will never do it. End of chapter 27《Chapter 28 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 28. The less wit a man has, the less he knows that he wants it. Hester always took charge of the three elder children and Fräulein of the baby during the six o'clock service, so that the nurse might go to church. On this particular Sunday afternoon, Hester and the children were waiting in the little hall till the bell stopped, before which moment they were forbidden to leave the house. Mr and Mrs Gressley had just started for the church, Mr Gressley looking worn and harassed, for since luncheon he had received what he called a perfectly unaccountable letter from one of his principal parishioners, a dissenter, who had been present at the morning service, and who Mr Gressley had confidently hoped might have been struck by the sermon. This hope had been justified, but not in the manner Mr. Gressley had expected. Mr. Walsh opined, in a large round hand, that as worms, twice under dash, did not usually pay voluntary church and school rates, he no longer felt himself under an obligation to do so, etc. The letter was a great and unexpected blow. Who could have foreseen such a result of the morning's eloquence? The truth is, said Mr. Gressley, tremulously, that they can't and won't hear reason they can't controvert what I say, so they take refuge in petty spite like this. I must own I am disappointed in Walsh. He is a man of some education, and liberal as regards money. I had thought he was better than most of them, and now he turns on me like this. It's a way worms have, said Hester. Oh, don't run a simile to death, Hester, said Mr. Gressley impatiently. If you had listened to what I tried to say this morning... You would have seen I only used the word worm figuratively. I never meant it literally, as anyone could see who was not determined to misunderstand me. 
Worms pay school rates. Such folly is positively sickening, if it were not malicious. Hester had remained silent. She had been deeply vexed for her brother at the incident. As the church bell stopped, the swing door opened, and Bulu hurried in, like a great personage, conscious that others have waited, and bearing with him an aroma of Irish stew and onions, which showed that he had been exchanging affabilities with the cook. For the truth must be owned. No spinster over forty could look unmoved on Bulu. Alas, for the vicarage cook, who had kept herself to herself for nearly fifty years, only to fall the victim of a grande passion for Bulu. The little Lovelace bounded in, and the expedition started. It was Reggie's turn to choose where they should go. He decided on the shrubbery, a little wood through which ran the private path to Wilderley. Dol Loftus had given the Gresses leave to take the children there. "'Oh, Reggie, we always go there,' said Mary, plaintively, who invariably chose the Pratt's Park with its rustic bridges and chalets, which Mr Pratt, in a gracious moment, had thrown open to the Gresleys on Sundays, because, as he expected, they must feel so cramped in their little garden. But Reggie adhered to his determination, and to the shrubberies they went. Hester was too tired to play with them, too tired even to tell them a story. So she sat under a tree while they circled in the coppice near at hand. As we grow older, we realise that in the new gardens where life leads us, we never learn the shrubs and trees by heart as we did as children in our old Garden of Eden, round the little gabled house where we were born. We were so thorough as children. We knew the underneath of every laurel bush, the shape of its bunches of darkling branches, the green dust that our small restless bodies rubbed off from its under twigs. We see now as strangers those little hanging horsetails of pink, which sad-faced elders called ribes. But once, long ago, when the world was young, we knew them eye to eye, and the compact little black insects on them, and the quaint taste of them, and the clean, clean smell of them. Everything had a taste in those days, and was submitted to that test, just as until it had been licked, the real colour of any object of interest was not ascertained. There was a certain scarlet berry, very red without and very white within, which we were warned was deadly poison. How well, after a quarter of a century, we remember the bitter taste of it. How much better than many other forbidden fruits duly essayed in later years. We ate those scarlet berries and lived, though warned to the contrary. Presently, Bulu, who could do nothing simply, found a dead mouse, for anyone else could have found it, in the middle of the path, and made it an occasion for a theatrical display of growlings and shakings. The children decided to bury it, and, after a becoming silence, their voices could be heard singing, Home, Sweet Home, as the body was being lowered into the grave previously dug by Bulu, who had to be forcibly restrained from going on digging it after the obsequies were over. He never knows when to stop, said Reggie wearily, as Bulu, with a little plaster of earth on his nose, was carried coughing back to Hester. As she took him, Rachel and Sybil came slowly down the path towards them, and the latter greeted Hester with an effusion which suggested that when two is not company, three may be. A most vexing thing has happened, said Sybil, in a gratified tone, sitting down under Hester's tree. I really don't think I am to blame. You know Mr. Tristram, the charming artist who has been staying with us? I know him, said Hester. Well, he was set on making a sketch of me for one of his large pictures, and it was to have been finished today. I don't see any harm myself in drawing on Sunday. I know the Gresties do, and I love the Gresties. He has such a powerful mind. But one must think for oneself, and it was only the upper lip. So I consented to sit for him at four o'clock. I noticed he seemed a little, well, rather... Just so, said Hester, the last few days, but, but of course I took no notice of it. A married woman often has to deal with such things without making a fuss about them. Well, I overstepped myself, and it was nearly half past four before I awoke. And when I went into my sitting room, the servant brought me a note. It was from him, saying he'd been obliged to leave Wilderley suddenly on urgent business, and asking that his baggage might be sent after him. Hester raised her eyes slightly as if words failed her. 
Sybil's conversation always interested her. Perhaps the reason she has never told anything, she said to herself, is because the ground the confidence would cover is invariably built over already by a fiction of her own, which it would not please her to see destroyed. Who would have thought, continued Sybil, that he would have behaved in that way because I was one little half-hour late? And, of course, the pretext of urgent business is too transparent, because there is no Sunday post, and the telegraph boy had not been up. I asked that, and he was so anxious to finish the sketch, he almost asked to stay over Sunday on purpose. Rachel and Hester looked on the ground. Rachel said he was all right in the garden just before, didn't you, Rachel? I said I thought he was a little nervous. And what did he talk to you about? He spoke about the low tone of the morals of the day, and about marriage. Ah, I don't wonder he talked to you, Rachel. You are so sympathetic. I expect lots of people confide in you about their troubles and love affairs. Morals of the day, marriage. Poor, poor Mr. Tristram. I shall tell Doll quietly this evening. On the whole, it is just as well he is gone. Just as well, said Rachel and Hester, with surprising unanimity. End of chapter 28 Chapter 29 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evans. Chapter 29. So fast does a little leaven spread within us. So incalculable is the effect of one personality on another. George Eliot. Hugh was not ill after what Mr. Gresty called his immersion but for some days he remained feeble and exhausted. Sybil quite forgot she had not liked him, insisted on his staying on indefinitely in Wilderley, and, undaunted by her distressing experience with Mr Tristram, read poetry to Hugh in the afternoons, and surrounded him with genuine warm-hearted care. Doll was steadily, quietly kind. It was during these days that Hugh and Rachel saw much of each other, during these days that Rachel passed, in spite of herself, beyond the anxious impersonal interest which Hugh had awakened in her, onto that slippery, much-trodden ground of uncomfortable possibilities where the unmarried meet. Hugh attracted and repelled her. It was, alas, easy to say why she was repelled. But who shall say why she was attracted? Has the secret law ever been discovered which draws one man and woman together amid the crowd? He was not among the best men who had wished to marry her, but nevertheless he was the only man, since Mr Tristram, who had succeeded in making her think continually of him. And perhaps she half knew that though she had been loved by better men, Hugh loved her better than they had. Which would prove the stronger, the attraction or the repulsion? How can I, she said to herself, over and over again. When I remember Lady Newhaven, how can I, when I think of what his conduct was for a whole year, how can I? Can he have any sense of honour to have acted like that? Is he even really sorry? He is very charming, very refined, and he loves me. He looks good, but what do I know of him except evil? He looks as if he could be faithful. But how can I trust him? Hugh fell into a deep dejection after his narrow escape. Dr Brown said it was nervous prostration, and Doll rode into Southminster and returned laden with comic papers. Who shall say whether the cause was physical or mental? Hugh had seen death very near for the first time, and the thought of death haunted him. He had not realised when he drew lots that he was risking the possibility of anything like that, such an entire going away, such an awful rending of his being as the short word death now conveyed to him. He had, had no idea it would be like that, and he had got to do it again. There was the crux. He had got to do it again. He leaned back, faint and shuddering, in the deck chair in the rose garden where he was lying. Presently Rachel appeared coming towards him, down the narrow grass walk between two high walls of hollyhocks. She had a cup of tea in her hand. 
I have brought you this, she said, with a warning that you'd better not come in to tea. Mr. Gressley has been sighted walking up the drive. Mrs. Loftus thought you would like to see him, but I reminded her that Dr. Brown said you were to be kept very quiet. Mr. Gressley had called every day since the accident in order to cheer the sufferer, to whom he had been greatly attracted. Hugh had seen him once, and afterwards had never felt strong enough to repeat the process. "'Must you go back?' he asked. "'No,' she said. "'Mrs. Loftus and he are great friends. I should be rather in the way.' And she sat down by him. "'Are you feeling ill?' she said gently, noticing his careworn face. "'No,' he replied. "'I was only thinking.' "'I was thinking,' he went on, after a pause, "'that I would give everything I possess "'not to have done something which I have done.' Rachel looked straight in front of her. The confession was coming at last. Her heart beat. "'I have done wrong,' he said slowly, "'and I am suffering for it, "'and I shall suffer more before I have finished.' But the worst is, she looked at him, the worst is that I can't bear all the consequences myself. An innocent person will pay the penalty of my sin. Hugh's voice faltered. He was thinking of his mother. Rachel's mind instantly flew to Lord Newhaven. Then Lord Newhaven drew the short lighter, she thought, and she coloured deeply. There was a long silence. Do you think, said Hugh, smiling faintly, that people are ever given a second chance? Always, said Rachel, if not here, afterwards. If I were given another, said Hugh, if I might only be given another now, in this life, I should take it. He was thinking if only he might be let off this dreadful self-inflicted death. She thought he meant that he repented of his sin and would fain do better. There was a sound of voices near at hand. Sybil and Mr. Gressley came down the grass towards them. London society, Mr. Gressley was saying, to live in a stuffy street away from the beauties of nature, its birds and flowers, to spend half my days laying traps for invitations and half my nights grinning like a fool in stifling drawing-rooms listening to vapid talk. No thanks. I know better than to care for London society. Hester does, I know but then Hester does not mind making up to big people, and I do. In fact, I have brought Mr. Gressley after all, in spite of Dr. Brown, said Sybil, because we were in the middle of such an interesting conversation on the snares of society that I knew you would like to hear it. You've had such a dull day with Doll away at his county council. That night, as Rachel sat in her room, she went over that half-made, ruthlessly interrupted confidence. He does repent, she said to herself, recalling the careworn face. If he does, can I ever look the past? Can I help him to make a fresh start? If he had not done this one dishonourable action, I could have cared for him. Can I now? End of chapter 29 Chapter 30 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 30. A Fool's Mouth is His Destruction. The superficial reader of these pages may possibly have forgotten, but the earnest one will undoubtedly remember, that in an earlier chapter a sale of work was mentioned which was to take place in the Wilderly Gardens at the end of August. The end of August had now arrived, and with it two white tents, which sprang up suddenly one morning like giant mushrooms on one of Doll's smooth-shaven lawns. He groaned in spirit as he watched their erection. They would ruin the turf. "'Might as well iron it with a hot iron,' he said disconsolately to Hugh. "'But of course this sort of thing, dousers and fun, eh? In these days we must stand by our colours.' He repeated Mr. Gressley's phrase. Dull seldom ventured on an opinion not sanctioned by the ages, or that he had not heard repeated till its novelty had been comfortably rubbed off by his wife or the Gressleys. 
The two men watched the proceedings mournfully. They could not help, at least they were told they could not help, the women busily engaged in draping and arranging the stalls. They were still at large, but Doll knew, as well as a dog who is going to be washed, what was in store for him in the afternoon, and he was depressed beforehand. Don't let yourself be run in, he said generously to Hugh. You're not up to it. It takes a strong man to grapple with this sort of thing. Kills off the weakly ones like flies. You lie low in the smoking room till it's all over. All I can say is, remarked Mrs. Gressley, as she and Hester led the vicarage donkey and cart up the drive, heavily laden with the work of many months, that the Pratts have behaved exceedingly badly. Here they are, the richest people by far in the parish, and they would not even take a stall. They would not even furnish half of one. And they said they would be away, and they're at the Towers, after all. No one likes the Pratts more than I do, or sees their good points as I do. But I can't shut my eyes to the fact that they are the meanest of the mean. The Pratts had only contributed two bedspreads, and a sheet sham, and a set of antimacassars. If the reader wishes to know what bedspreads and sheet shams are, let him ask his intended, and let him see to it that he marries a woman who cannot tell him. Mrs. Pratt had bought the antimacassars for the towers, and secretly adored them, until Ada pronounced them to be vulgar. The number of things which Ada discovered to be vulgar increased every day, and included the greater part of her mother's wardrobe, much to the distress of that poor lady. Mrs. Pratt had reached the size when it is prudent to concentrate a love of bright colours in one's parasol. On this particular afternoon she shed tears over the fact that Ada refused to accompany her if her mother wore a unique garment of orange satin covered with what appeared to be a plague of black worms. Of course, the sale of work was combined with a garden party, and a little after three o'clock carriage after carriage began to arrive, and Sybil, with a mournful, handsome, irreproachably dressed husband, took up her position on the south front to receive her guests. The whole neighbourhood had been invited, and it can generally be gauged with tolerable accuracy by a hostess of some experience who will respond to the call and who will stay away. Sybil and her husband were among those who were not to be found at these festivities, neither were the New Havens, save at their own, nor the Pontisburys, nor the Bishop of Southminster. Cards had, of course, been sent to each, but no one expected them to appear. Presently, among the stream of arrivals, Sybil noticed the slender figure of Lady Newhaven, and, astonishing vision, Lord Newhaven beside her. "'Wonders will never cease,' said Doll, shaken for a moment out of the apathy of endurance. Sybil raised her eyebrows and advanced with a prettyish air of empressement to meet her unexpected guests. No, clearly it was impossible that the two women should like each other. They were the same age, about the same height and colouring. Their social position was too similar, their historic houses too near each other. Lady Newhaven was by far the best looking, but that was not a difference which attracted Sybil towards her. On this occasion, Sybil's face assumed its most squirrel-like expression, for, as ill luck would have it, they were dressed alike. Lady Newhaven looked very ethereal as she came slowly across the grass in her diaphanous gown of rich white, covered with a flowing veil of thinnest transparent black. Her blue eyes looked restlessly bright. Her lips wore a mechanical smile. Rachel, watching her, experienced a sudden pang at her undeniable loveliness. It wounded her suddenly, as it had never done before. I am a common-looking, square-built woman compared to her, she turned to herself. No wonder he... She instinctively drew back as Lady Newhaven turned quickly towards her. You dear person, said Lady Newhaven, her eyes moving restlessly over the crowd. Are you still here? Let us go and buy something together. How nice you look! Without looking at her. She drew Rachel apart in the direction of the tents. Where is he? she said sharply. I know he is here. I heard all about the accident, though Edward never told me. I don't see him. He's not in the gardens. He's not coming out. He is still rather knocked up. I thought I should have died when I heard it. Ah, oh, Rachel, never love anyone. You don't know what it's like. But I must see him. I've come here on purpose. 
So I supposed. Edward would come too. He appeared at the last moment when the carriage came round, though I have never known him to go to a garden party in his life. But where is he, Rachel? Somewhere in the house, I suppose. I shan't know where to find him. I can't be wandering about that woman's house by myself. We must slip away together, Rachel, and you must take me to him. I must see him alone for five minutes. Rachel shook her head. Captain Pratt, tall, pale, cautious, immaculate, his cane held along his spinal column, appeared suddenly close at hand. Mrs Loftus is fortunate in her day, he remarked, addressing himself to Lady Newhaven, and observing her fixedly with cold admiration. I seldom come to this sort of thing, but neighbours of the country must support each other. I see you are on your way to the tents. Pray allow me to carry your purchases for you. Oh, don't let me trouble you said Lady Newhaven, shrinking imperceptibly. But it was no trouble to Captain Pratt, and they walked on together. Lord Newhaven, who could not have been far off, joined Rachel. Well, my dear, said Mrs Pratt to Ada, you might have let me wear my black and orange after all, for you see Lady Newhaven has something very much the same, only hers is white underneath. And do you see she's got two diamond butterflies on, the little one at her throat and the big one holding her white carnations? and you would not let me put on a single thing. There now, Algy has joined her, continued Mrs Pratt, her attention quickly diverted from her own wrongs. Now they are walking on together. How nice he looks in those beautiful clothes. Algy and Lord Newhaven and Mr Loftus all have the same look, haven't they? All friends together, as I often say. Such a mercy among county people. You might walk a little with Lord Newhaven, Ada. It's unaccountable how seldom we see him. But always so pleasant when we do. Ah, he's speaking to Rachel West. They're going to the tents, after all. Well, whatever you may say, I do think we ought to go and buy something, too. Papa says he won't put his hand in his pocket if the Loftuses are to get all the credit. And we ought to have had the choice of having the sale at the Towers, so he shan't do anything. But I think it would be nice if we went and bought a little something, just a five-pound note. You shall spend it, my dear, if you like. This is sheer recklessness, said Lord Newhaven, as Rachel bought an expensive tea cosy from Fraulein. In these days of death duties you cannot possess four teapots, and you've already bought three teapot costumes. That is what I am here for, said Rachel, producing a cheque book. How much did you say, Fraulein? Twenty seven and six, said Fraulein. Now I see it in the full light. I have taken a fancy to it myself, said Lord Newhaven. I never saw anything the least like it. I don't think I could allow you to appropriate it, Miss West. You are sweeping up all the best things. I have a very pretty thing for gentlemen, said Fraulein. Herr Braun has just brought one. Very elaborate indeed. Uh, Bible markers, I presume. Oh, uh, braces. Never mind, they will be equally useful to me. I'll have them. Now for the tea cosy, it's underpriced. I consider that with the chenille swallow it's worth thirty shillings. I'll give thirty for it. Thirty-two and six, said Rachel. The landed interest is not going to be browbeaten by coal mines. Thirty-three and tuppence. Forty shillings, said Rachel. Forty-two, said Lord Newhaven. Everyone in the tent had turned to watch the bidding. Forty-two and six, said Rachel. Fraulein blushed. She had worked the tea cosy. It was to her a sonata in red plush. Three guineas, said Captain Pratt, by an infallible instinct, perceiving and placing himself within the focus of general interest. The bidding ceased instantly. Lord Newhaven shrugged his shoulders and turned away. Fraulein, still shaking with conflicting emotions, handed the tea cosy to Captain Pratt. He took it with an acid smile, secretly disgusted at the sudden cessation of interest for which he had paid rather highly, and looked round for Lady Newhaven but she had disappeared. Fancy you and Algy bidding against each other like that, said Ada Pratt archly to Lord Newhaven, for though Ada was haughty in general society, she could be sporty and even friskly ingratiating towards those of her fellow creatures whom she termed swells. Why, half Middleshire will be saying that you have quarrelled next. Only those who do not know how intimate Captain Pratt and I really are could think we have quarrels, 
said North Newhaven, his eyes wandering over the crowd. But I am blocking your way, and Mrs. Pratt's. How do you do, Mrs. Pratt? And Miss West, your burden is greater than you can bear. You are dropping part of it. I don't know what it is, but I can shut my eyes as I pick it up. I insist on carrying half back to the house. It will give a pleasing impression that I have bought largely. Weren't you pleased at the money we wrung out of Captain Pratt? He never thought we should stop bidding. It's about all the family will contribute, unless that good old Mamma Pratt buys something. She's the only one of the family I can tolerate. Is Scarlet still here? I ought to have asked after him before. He's here, but he's not well. He's in hiding in the smoking room. He's lucky he's no worse. I should have had rheumatic fever if I'd been in his place. How cool it is here after the glare outside. Must you go out again? Well, I consider I've done my duty and that I may fairly allow myself a cigarette in peace. Really, Mr. Loftus, I'm quite shocked. This absurd fakeness. The tent was very crowded and there is not much air today, is there? I shall be all right if I may sit quietly in the hall a little. How deliciously cool in here after the glare outside. A glass of water? Oh, thanks. Yes, only I hate to be so troublesome. And how are you after that dreadful accident in the boat? Oh, I'm all right, said Doll, who by this time hated the subject. It was Scarlet who was nearly frozen like New Zealand lamb. Doll had heard Mr. Gresty far off the simile of the lamb and considered it sound. How absurd you are! You always make me laugh. I suppose he's left now that he's unfrozen. Oh, no, he's still here. We would not let him go till he was better. He's not up to much. Weak chap at the best of times, I should think. He's lying low in the smoking room till the people are gone. Mr. Scarlet is an old friend of ours, said Lady Newhaven, sipping her glass of water and spitting a little. But I can't quite forgive him. No, I really can't for the danger he caused to Edward. You know, or, or perhaps you don't know, that Edward can't swim either. Even now I can't bear to think what might have happened. She closed her eyes with evident emotion. Doll's stolid garden-party face relaxed. Good little woman, he thought, as fond of him as she can be. All's well that ends well, he remarked aloud. Doll did not know that he was quoting Shakespeare, but he did know by long experience that this sentence could be relied on as suitable to the occasion, or to any occasion that looked a little doddery and finished up all right. And now, Mr Loftus, positively, I must insist on you leaving me quietly here. I'm quite sure you are wanted outside, and I should blame myself if you wasted another minute on me. It was only the sun which affected me. Don't mention it to Edward. He is always so fussy about me. I will rest quietly here for a quarter of an hour, and then rejoin you all again in the garden. I hope I'm not disturbing anyone, said Lord Newhaven, quietly entering the smoking room. Well, Scarlet, how are you getting on? Hugh, who was lying on a sofa with his arms raised and his hands behind his head, looked up, and his expression changed. He was thinking of something uncommonly pleasant, thought the old Newhaven. Not of me or mine, I fancy. I've come to smoke a cigarette in peace, he had added aloud, if you don't object. Of course not. Lord Newhaven lit his cigarette and puffed a moment in silence. Odd outside, he said. Hugh nodded. He wondered how soon he could make a pretext for getting up and leaving the room. There was a faint silken rustle, and Lady Newhaven, pale, breathless, came swiftly in and closed the door. The instant afterward, she saw her husband, and shrank back with a little cry. Lord Newhaven did not look at her. His eyes were fixed on Hugh. Hugh's face became suddenly ugly, livid. He rose slowly to his feet and stood motionless. He hates her, said Lord Newhaven to himself, and he removed his glance and came forward. You were looking for me, Violet, he remarked. I have no doubt you are wishing to return home. We'll go at once. He threw away his cigarette. Well, good-bye, Scarlet, in case we don't meet again. I dare say you will pay West Hope a visit later on. Ah, Captain Pratt, so you have fled like us from the madding crowd. I can recommend Loftus's cigarettes. I've just had one myself. Good-bye. Did you leave your purchases in the hall, Violet? Yes. Then we will collect them on our way. 
the husband and wife were halfway down the grand staircase before Lord Newhaven said, in his usual even voice, I must ask you once more to remember that I will not have any scandal attached to your name. Did not you see that white mongrel Pratt was on your track? If I had not been there when he came in, he would have drawn his own vile conclusions, and for once they would have been correct. He could not think worse of me than you do, said the wife, half cowed, half defiant. No, but he could say so, which I don't. Or what is more probable, he could use his knowledge to obtain a hold over you. He is a dangerous man. Don't put yourself in his power. I don't want to, or in anybody's. Then avoid scandal instead of courting it, and don't repeat the folly of this afternoon. Captain Pratt did not remain long in the smoking-room. He had only a slight acquaintance with Hugh, which did not appear capable of expansion. Captain Pratt made a few efforts, proved its inelastic properties, and presently lounged out again. Hugh moved slowly to the window and leaned his throbbing forehead against the stone mullion. He was still weak, and the encounter with Lady Newhaven had shaken him. "'What did he mean?' he said to himself, bewildered and suspicious. Perhaps I should be staying at West Ham later on. But of course I shall never go there again. He knows that as well as I do. What did he mean? End of chapter 30 Chapter 31 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 31 The bird of time has but a little way to flutter, and the bird is on the wing. Omar Khayyam It was the third week of November. Winter, the destroyer, was late, but he had come at last. There was death in the air. A whisper of death stole across the empty fields and bare hillside. The birds heard it and were silent. The November wind was hurrying round Westhope Abbey, shaking its bare trees. Lord Newhaven stood looking fixedly out eastward across the level land to the low hills beyond. He stood so long that the day died and twilight began to rub out first the hills and then the long white lines of flooded meadow and blurred pollard willows. Presently the river mist rose up to meet the coming darkness. In the east, low and lurid, a tawny moon crept up the livid sky. She made no moonlight on the grey earth. Lord Newhaven moved away from the window, where he had become a shadow among the shadows, and sat down in the dark at his writing table. Presently he turned on the electric lamp at his elbow and took a letter out of his pocket. The circle of shaded light fell on his face as he read, the thin, grave face with the steady, inscrutable eyes. He read the letter slowly, evidently not for the first time. If I had not been taken by surprise at the moment, I should not have consented to the manner in which our differences were settled. Personally, I consider the old arrangement, to which you regretfully alluded at the time, pistols for two and coffee for four, I remember perfectly, as preferable. And as you appeared to think so yourself, would it not be advisable to resort to it? Believing that the old arrangement will meet your wishes as fully as it does mine, I trust that you will entertain this suggestion and that you will agree to a meeting with your own choice of weapons on any pretext you may choose to name within the next week. The letter ended there. It was unsigned. The time is certainly becoming short, said Lord Newhaven. He's right in saying there's only a week left. If it were not for the scandal or for the boys, and if I thought he would really hold to the compact, I would meet him. But he won't. He flinched when he drew lots. He won't. He has courage enough to stand up in front of me for two minutes and take his chance, but not to blow his own brains out. No. And if he knew what is in store for him if he does not, he would not have courage to face that either. Nor should I, if I were in his shoes, poor devil. The first six foot of earth would be good enough for me. He threw the letter with its envelope into the fire and watched it burn. Then he took up the gold pen which his wife had given him, 
examined the nib, dipped it very slowly in the ink, and wrote with sudden swiftness, Allow me to remind you that you made no objection at the time to the manner of our encounter and my choice of weapons, by means of which publicity was avoided. The risk was equal. You now, at the last moment, propose that I should run it a second time, and in a manner to cause instant scandal. I must decline to do so, or to reopen the subject, which has received my careful consideration before I decided upon it. I have burned your letter, and desire you will burn mine. Poor devil, said Lord Newhaven, putting the letter, not in the post-box at his elbow, but in his pocket. Loftus and I did him an ill term when we pulled him out of the water. The letter took its own time, for it had to avoid possible pitfalls. It shunned the company of the other western letters. It avoided the village post office. But after a day's delay it was launched, and lay among a hundred others in a station pillar box. And then it hurried, hurried as fast as express train could take it, till it reached its London address, and went softly upstairs, and laid itself, with a few others, on Hugh's breakfast table. For many weeks since his visit at Wilderley, Hugh had been like a man in a boat without oars, drifting slowly, imperceptibly, on the placid current of a mighty river, who far away hears the falls of Niagara droning like a bumblebee in a lily cup. Long ago, in the summer, he had recognised the sound, had realised the steep agony towards which the current was bearing him, and had struggled horribly, impotently, against the inevitable. But of late, though the sound was ever in his ears, welling up out of the blue distance, he had given up the useless struggle, and lay still in the sunshine, watching the summer woods slide past, and the clouds sail away, always away and away, to the birthplace of the river, to that little fluttering pulse in the heart of the hills, which a woman's hand might cover, the infant pulse of the great river to be. Hugh's thoughts went back, like the clouds, towards that tiny spring of passion in his own life. He felt that he could have forgiven it, and himself, if he'd been swept into the vortex of a headlong mountain torrent leaping down its own wild waterway, carrying all before it. Other men he had seen, who had been wrested off their feet, swept out of their own keeping by such a torrent on the steep hillside of their youth. But it had not been so with him. He had walked more cautiously than they. As he walked, he had stopped to look at the little thread of water which came bubbling up out of its white pebbles. It was so pretty, it was so feeble, it was so clear. Involuntarily, he followed it, watched it grow, amused himself half contemptuously with it, helped its course by turning obstacles from its path. It never rushed, it never leaped, it was a toy. The day came when it spread itself safe and shallow on level land, and he embarked upon it. But he was quickly tired of it. It was beginning to run muddily through a commonplace country, past squalid polluting towns and villages. The hills were long since gone. He turned to row to the shore, and behold, his oars were gone. He'd been trapped to his own destruction. He had never regarded seriously his intrigue with Lady Newhaven. He had been attracted, excited partially, half-willingly enslaved. He had thought at the time that he loved her, and that supposition had confirmed him in his cheap cynicism about women. This, then, was her paltry little court, where man offered mock homage, and where she played at being queen. He had made the discovery that love was a much overrated passion. He'd always supposed so, but when he tired of Lady Newhaven, he was sure of it. His experience was, after all, only the same as that which many men acquire by marriage, and hold unshaken through long and useful lives. But Hugh had not been able to keep the treasures of this early experience. It had been rendered worthless, perhaps rather contemptible by a later one, that of falling in love with Rachel, and the astonishing discovery that he was in love for the first time. He had sold his birthright for a mess of red pottage, as surely as any man or woman who marries for money or liking. 
he had not believed in his birthright, and, holding it to be worthless, had given it to the first person who had offered him anything in exchange. His whole soul had gradually hardened itself against Lady Newhaven. If he had loved her, he said to himself, he could have borne his fate. But the play had not been worth the candle. His position was damnable. But that he could have borne, at least, so he thought, if he had had his day. But he had not had it. That thought rankled. To be hounded out of life because he had mistaken paper money for real was not only unfair, it was grotesque. Gradually, however, Hugh forgot his smouldering hate of Lady Newhaven, his sense of injustice and anger against fate. He forgot everything in his love for Rachel. It became the only reality of his life. He had remained in London throughout October and November, cancelling all his engagements because she was there. What her work was, he vaguely apprehended, that she was spending herself and part of her colossal fortune in the East End. But he took no interest in it. He was incapable of taking more interests into his life at this time. He passed many quiet evenings with her in the house in Park Lane, which she had lately bought. The little secretary who lived with her had always a faint smile and more writing to do than usual on the evenings when he dined with them. A great peace was over all their intercourse. Perhaps it was the hush before the storm, the shadow of which was falling, falling with each succeeding day, across the minds of both. Once, only a sudden gust of emotion stirred the quiet air, but it dropped again immediately. It came with the hour when Hugh confessed to her the blot upon his past. The past was taking upon itself ever an uglier and more repulsive aspect as he saw more of Rachel. It was hard to put into words, but he spoke of it. A spectre of love rose like a ghost between them, as they looked earnestly at each other, each pale, even in the ruddy firelight. Hugh was truthful in an intention. He was determined he would never lie to Rachel. He implied an intrigue with a married woman, a deviation not only from morality, but from honour. More he did not say. But as he looked at her strained face, it seemed to him that she expected something more. A dreadful silence fell between them when he had finished. Had she then no word for him? Her eyes, mute, imploring, dark, with an agony of suspense, met his for a second and fell instantly. She did not speak. Her silence filled him with despair. He got up. It's getting late. I must go, he stammered. She rose mechanically and put out her hand. May I come again? he said, holding it more tightly than he knew, and looking intently at her. Was he going to be dismissed? The pain he caused her hand recalled her to herself. A look of bewilderment crossed her face, and then she realised his suspense and said gravely, You may come again. He kissed the hand he held, and as he did so he knew for the first time that she loved him. But he could not speak of love after what he had just told her. He looked back when he reached the door and saw her standing where he had left her. She had raised the hand he had kissed to her lips. That was three days ago. Since then he had not dared to go and see her. He could not ask her to marry him when he was within a few days of the time when he was bound in so-called honour to give Lord Newhaven satisfaction. He certainly could not be in her presence again without asking her. The shadows of the last weeks had suddenly become ghastly realities once more. The roar of Niagara drowned all other sounds. What was he going to do? What was he going to do in the predicament towards which he had been drifting so long, which was now actually upon him. Who shall say what horror, what agony of mind, what frenzied searching for a way of escape, what anguish of baffled love crowded in on Hugh's mind during those last days? At the last moment he caught at a straw and wrote to Lord Newhaven, offering to fight him. He did not ask himself what he should do if Lord Newhaven refused. But when Lord Newhaven did refuse, his determination 
long unconsciously fostered, sprang full grown into existence in a sudden access of passionate anger and blind rage. He won't fight, will he? He thinks I will die like a rat in a trap with all my life before me. I will not. I offered him a fair chance of revenging himself. I could have fired into the air. And if he won't take it, it is his own lookout. Damn him. He can shoot at me at sight if he likes. Let him. End of chapter 31 Chapter 32 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 32. On ne peut jamais dire. Fontaine, je ne boire jamais de tonneau. If we could choose our ills, we should not choose suspense. Rachel aged perceptibly during these last weeks. Her strong white hands became thinner, her lustreless eyes and haggard face betrayed her. In years gone by, she had said to herself, when a human love had failed her, I will never put myself through this torture a second time. Whatever happens, I will not endure it again. And now she was enduring it again, though in a different form. There is an element of mother love in the devotion which some women give to men. In the first instance, it had opened the door of Rachel's heart to Hugh, and had gradually merged with other feelings, and deepened into the painful love of a woman not in her first youth, for a man of whom she is not sure. Rachel was not sure of Hugh. Of his love for her she was sure, but not of the man himself, the gentle, refined, lovable nature that mutely worshipped and clung to her. She could not repulse him any more than she could repulse a child. But, through all her knowledge of him, the knowledge of love, the only true knowledge of our fellow creatures, a thread of doubtful anxiety was interwoven. She could form some idea how men like Dick, Lord Newhaven, or the Bishop would act in given circumstances, but she could form no definite idea how Hugh would act in the same circumstances. Yet she knew Hugh a thousand times better than any of the others. Why was this? Many women before Rachel have sought diligently to find, and have shut their eyes diligently, lest they should discover what it is that is dark to them in the character of the man they love. Perhaps Rachel half knew all the time the subtle inequality in Hugh's character. Perhaps she loved him all the better for it. Perhaps she knew that if he had been without a certain undefinable weakness, he would not have been drawn towards her strength. She was stronger than he, and perhaps she loved him more than she could have loved an equal. Les esprits faibles ne sont jamais sincères. She had come across that sentence one day in a book she was reading, and had turned suddenly blind and cold with anger. He is sincere, she said fiercely, as if repelling an accusation. He would never deceive me. No one had accused Hugh. The same evening he made the confession for which she had waited so long. As he began to speak, an intolerable suspense, like a new and acute form of a familiar disease, lay hold on her. Was he going to live or die? She should know at last. Was she to part with him, to bury love for the second time? Or was she to keep him, to be his wife, the mother of his children? As he went on, his language becoming more confused, she hardly listened to him. She had known all that too long. She had forgiven it, not without tears, but still, she had forgiven it long ago. Then he stopped. It seemed to Rachel as if she had reached a moment in life which she could not bear. She waited, but still he did not speak. Then she was not to know. She was to be ground between the millstones of four more dreadful days and nights. She suddenly became aware, as she stared at Hugh's blanching face, that he believed she was about to dismiss him thought had never entered her mind. Do you not know that I love you? she said silently to him as he kissed her hand. When he had left her, a gleam of comfort came to her, the only gleam that lightened the days and nights that followed. It was not his fault if he had made a half confession. If he had gone on and had told her of the drawing of lots and which had drawn the fatal lot, 
he would have been wanting in sense of honour. He owed it to the man he had injured to preserve entire secrecy. He told me of the sin which might affect my marrying him, said Rachel, but the rest had nothing to do with me. He was right not to speak of it. If he had told me, and then a few days afterwards Lord Newhaven had committed suicide, he would know I should put two and two together, and who the woman was, and the secret would not have died with Lord Newhaven as it ought to do. But if Hugh were the man who had to kill himself, he might have told me so without a breach of confidence, because then I should never have guessed who the others were. If he were the man, he could have told me. He certainly would have told me, for it could have done no harm to anyone. Surely Lady Newhaven must be right when she was so certain that her husband had drawn the short lighter. And she herself had gained the same impression from what Hugh had vaguely said at Wilderley. But what are impressions, suppositions, except the food of suspense? Rachel sighed and took up her burden as best she could. Hugh's confession had at least one source of comfort in it deadly cold comfort if he were about to leave her. She knew that night as she lay awake that she had not quite trusted him up till now, by the sense of entire trust and faith in him which rose up to meet his self-accusation. What might have turned away Rachel's heart from him had had the opposite effect. He told me the worst of himself that he risked losing me by doing it. He wished me to know before he asked me to marry him. Though he acted dishonourably once, he is an honourable man. He has shown himself upright in his dealing with me. Hugh came back no more after that evening. Rachel told herself she knew why. She understood. He could not speak of love and marriage when the man he had injured was on the brink of death. Her heart stood still when she thought of Lord Newhaven, a gentle, kindly man who was almost her friend, and who was playing with such quiet dignity a losing game. Hugh had taken from him his wife, and by that act was now taking from him his life, too. It was an even chance, she groaned. Hugh is not responsible for his death. Oh, my God! At least he is not responsible for that. It might have been he who had to die instead of Lord Newhaven. But if it is he, surely he could not leave me without a word. If it is he, he would have come to bid me good-bye. He cannot go down into silence without a word. If it is he, he will come yet. She endured through the two remaining days, turning faint with terror each time the doorbell rang, lest it might be Hugh. But Hugh did not come. Then, after repeated frantic telegrams from Lady Newhaven, she left London precipitately to go to her, as she had promised, on the 28th of November, the evening of the last day of the five months. End of chapter 32Chapter 33 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 33 And he went out immediately, and it was night. It was nearly dark when Rachel reached West of Abbey. A great peace seemed to pervade the long, dim lines of the gardens, and to be gathered in the solemn arches of the ruins against the darkening sky. Through the low doorway, a faint light of welcome peered. As she drove up, she was aware of two tall figures pacing amicably together in the dusk. As she passed them, she heard Lord Newhaven's low laugh at something his companion had said. A sense of unreality seized her. It was not the world which was out of joint, which was rushing to its destruction. It must be she who was mad, stark mad, to believe these chimeras. As she got out of the carriage, a step came lightly along the gravel, and Lord Newhaven emerged into the little ring of light by the archway. "'It's very good of you to come,' he said cordially, with extended hand. "'My poor wife is very unwell, and expecting you anxiously. She told me she had sent for you.' All was unreal, the familiar rooms and passages, the flickering light of the wood fire in the drawing room, the darkened room into which Rachel stole softly and knelt down, beside a trembling white figure, which held her with a drowning clutch. "'I will be in the drawing-room after dinner,' Lady Newhaven whispered hoarsely. "'I won't dine down. I can't bear to see him.' It was all unreal, 
except the jealousy which suddenly took Rachel by the throat and nearly choked her. I have undertaken what is beyond my strength, she said to herself as she hastily dressed for dinner. How shall I bear it when she speaks of him? How shall I go through with it? Presently she was dining alone with Lord Newhaven. He mentioned that it was Dick Vernon with whom he had been walking when she arrived. Dick was staying in Southminster for business, combined with hunting, and had written over. Lord Haven looked furtively at Rachel as he mentioned Dick. Her indifference was evidently genuine. She's not grown thin and parted with what little looks she possessed on Dick's account, he said to himself, and the remembrance slipped across his mind of Hugh's first word when he recovered consciousness after drowning. Rachel. I would have asked Dick to dine, continued Lord Newhaven, when the servants had gone. But I thought two was company and three none, and that it was not fair on you and Barnet to have him on your hands, as I am obliged to go to London on business by the night express. He was amazed at the instantaneous effect of his words. Rachel's face became suddenly livid, and she sank a bank in her chair. He saw that it was only by a supreme effort that she prevented herself from fainting. The truth flashed into his mind. She knows, he said to himself, that imbecile, that brainless viper to whom I am tied, is actually confided in her. And she and Scarlet are in love with each other, and the suspense is wearing her out. He looked studiously away from her, and continued a desultory conversation, but his face darkened. The little boys came in and pressed themselves one on each side of their father, their eyes glued on the crystallised cherries. Rachel had recovered herself, and she watched the children and their father with a pain at her heart, which was worse than the faintness. She had been unable to believe that if Lord Newhaven had drawn the short lighter, he would remain quietly here over the dreadful morrow, under the same roof as Teddy and Pawley. There was surely nothing horrible could happen so near them. Yet he seemed to have no intention of leaving Westham. Then perhaps he had not drawn the short lighter after all. At the moment when suspense, momentarily lulled, was once more rising hideous, colossal, he casually mentioned that he was leaving by the night train. The reason was obvious. The shock of relief almost stunned her. He would do it quietly tomorrow, away from home, she said to herself, watching him with miserable eyes, as he divided the cherries equally between the two boys. She dreaded going upstairs to Lady Newhaven, but anything was better than remaining in the dining room. She rose hurriedly, and the boys raced to the door and struggled which should open it for her. Lady Newhaven was lying on a sofa by the wood fire in the drawing room. Rachel went straight up to her and said hoarsely, And Lord Newhaven tells me he's going to London this evening by the night express. Lady Newhaven threw up her arms. Then it is he, she said. When he stayed on and on up to today, I began to be afraid that it was not he after all. And yet little things made me feel sure it was, and he was only waiting to do it before me and the children. I've been so horribly frightened. Oh, that he might only go away, and that I might never, never look upon his face again. Rachel sat down by the latticed window and looked out into the darkness. She could not bear to look at Lady Newhaven. Was there any help anywhere from this horror of death without, from this demon of jealousy within? I am her only friend, she said to herself over and over again. I cannot bear it, and I must bear it. I cannot desert her now. She has no one to turn to but me. Rachel, where are you? said the feeble, plaintive voice. Rachel rose and went unsteadily towards her. It was fortunate the room was lit only by the firelight. Sit down by me here on the sofa and let me lean against you. You do come for me, Rachel, though you say nothing. You are the only true friend I have in the world, the only woman who really loves me. Your cheek is quite wet and you are actually trembling. You always feel for me. I can bear it now you are here and he is going away. When the boys had been reluctantly coerced to bed, Lord Newhaven rang for his valet, told him what to pack, that he should not want him to accompany him, and then went to his sitting room on the ground floor. Scarlet seems a fortunate person, he said, pacing up and down. That woman loves him. 
and if she marries him, she will reform him. Is he going to escape altogether in this world and the next, if there is a next? Is there no justice anywhere? Perhaps at this moment he is thinking that he has salved his conscience by offering to fight, and that after all I can't do anything to prevent his living and marrying her if he chooses. He knows well enough I shall not touch him or sue for a divorce, for fear of the scandal. He thinks he has me there, and he's right. But he is mistaken if he thinks I can do nothing. I may as well go up to London and see for myself whether he is still on his feet tomorrow night. It's a mere formality, but I will do it. I might have guessed that she would try to smirch her own name and the boys through her if she had the chance. She would defeat me yet, unless I am careful. Oh, ye gods, why did I marry a fool who does not even know her own interests? If I had life over again, I would marry a Becky Sharp, any she-devil incarnate, if only she had brains. One cannot circumvent a fool because one can't foresee their line of action. But Miss West, for a miracle, is safe. She has a lock and key face. But she's not for Scarlet. Did Scarlet tell her himself in an access of moral spring cleaning preparatory to matrimony? No. He may have told her that he had got into trouble with some woman, but not about the drawing of lots. Whatever his faults are, he has the instincts of a gentleman and his mouth is shut. I can trust him like myself there. But she's not for him. He may think he will marry her, but I draw the line there. Violet and I have other views for him. He can live if he wants to, and apparently he does want to, but whether he will continue to want to is another question. But he shall not have Rachel. She must marry Dick. A distant rumbling was heard of the carriage driving under the stable archway on its way to the front door. Lord Newhaven picked up a novel with a mark in it and left the room. In the passage he stopped a moment at the foot of the narrow black oak staircase to the nurseries, which had once been his own nurseries. All was very silent. He listened, hesitated, his foot on the lowest stair. The butler came round the corner to announce the carriage. Um, I shall be back in four days at the furthest, Lord Newhaven said to him, and, turning, went on quickly to the hall, where the piercing night air came in with the stamping of the impatient horse's hoofs. A minute later, the two listening women upstairs heard the carriage drive away into the darkness, and a great silence settled down upon the house. End of chapter 33